Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So this is uh, Professor Sunil Sangra here from the Jindal School of Liberal Arts and Humanities, OP Jindal University at Sonipat uh, in the Delhi NCR area. And uh, it's an absolute joy to be here with you today. So thank you for taking time out and uh, making an effort to, to be a part of this. Uh, as you all know, we are living in these uh, strange times. And uh, ideally, one would have preferred different ways of doing this, maybe face to face if possible. But having said that, uh, the topic is in a way very interesting because uh, it is because of what is happening with the post industrial revolution that uh, despite the lockdown, despite the constraints, we are actually able to connect and make something like this possible, right? And chances are all of you could be from uh, different parts of the country or maybe even different parts of the world, right? Having said that, I want to share uh, a few slides with you. So I'm going to start uh, doing that right now. And once the slides are up, we will get into uh, uh, the presentation. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, like I said, a warm welcome. Yeah. And uh, this topic, I think, is a particularly interesting topic, uh, given the environment that we are we are currently uh, faced with. Who would have anticipated that technology and elements of technology could begin to start playing such a major role so quickly in so many sectors, and particularly in the context of education? And therefore, as we go deeper into the into the webinar, I'm going to try and contextualize this also to the education sector to some extent. Yeah. So the broad structure of the webinar looks something like this. Uh, first, a quick understanding of what is the post industrial revolution. Many of you might already know it. In case you do, this is a this, this will be a quick refresher for you. And uh, for the others, it will perhaps be an interesting uh, uh, insight into what is the post industrial revolution and why is it important, right? The second thing is, what are the implications of the post industrial revolution? And uh, the most important point as far as this webinar is concerned, which is what is the relevance uh, in the context of the liberal arts? Yeah. So, you know, uh, for humanity started uh, living a more structured existence, essentially with the agricultural, uh, when, when we started moving towards agricultural activities, which was maybe 10,000 years ago or so, right? And then over a period of time, we evolved into various uh, developments or various uh, advancements that, that we made as humanity, right? But uh, there have been some fundamental uh, moments in our evolution where, uh, which have sparked off uh, a, parent, a change in paradigm in the way we do things, in the way we create economic value, we conduct uh, activities and so on and so forth, right? So the first real industrial revolution was around the steam engine right and uh, the, the very fact that steam could be leveraged for uh, doing a lot of ta tasks a lot of activities which till then were relying on um, on human or or animal uh, labor and so on right the second industrial revolution which was about uh, the introduction of electricity and the application of electricity towards uh, mass manufacturing the entire assembly line uh, framework which is used so much in modern manufacturing today and the third industrial revolution, which is in the started off really showing a significant impact in the middle to late 1900s, was about uh, the uh, revolution to do with computing, right? Where computers started uh, playing a bigger role in, in what we are doing and, uh, and the activities that we are performing, the efficiency that we are trying to gain in various industries and in various sectors, could be industry, government, business, social sector, and so on and so forth. And today we are at a very interesting stage where we are talking about again another paradigm shift that is currently underway and which is likely to gain even greater momentum as we go forward into the future. And uh, some people call it the fourth industrial revolution, right? So what is uh, the fourth industrial revolution? We will try and get into further details of that. The key characteristics here are that various technologies are evolving exponentially, right? 
Traditionally, things have been evolving linearly, but now we are evolving exponentially. What is exponential? I will explain that to you in a short while. And as a result of that, the implication of this exponential evolution of various technologies is number one, the speed, the velocity, because from linear, we are moving to exponential. The second is in terms of the breadth and depth, that is uh, in terms of how many of these technologies can often come together and alter the shape and structure that we have currently been used to in terms of doing various uh, things, the way industries have structured themselves and so on and so forth. And the third is that the impact of many of these technologies is going to be at the level of entire systems getting modified or changing, right? So velocity, breadth and depth, and systems impact are some of the key characteristics of the post industrial revolution as we talk about it. <clears throat> and this is really the, the crux of, of what is driving this, this post industrial revolution. This is taken from a uh, from an issue in the Time magazine that came out in 2011, right? Uh, seems old, seems about nine years old, but I think it's a wonderful uh, replication of what they are trying to suggest. And they call it the accelerating pace of change, right? So one of the key drivers for the post industrial revolution is the huge evolution in computing power that is taking place, right? Um, so the estimation is that roughly by about 2015 or so, the power of one desktop computer uh, was considered to be equivalent to the power of uh, the brain of a mouse, right? The projection is that by 2023, the power of one desktop computer will be equivalent to the brain of one human being. And the further projection is that by 2045, the power of one desktop computer is likely to be greater than the power of all seven and a half billion human brains on the planet combined, right? So there is going to be an explosion in the amount of computing power that is going to be available. And a lot of it uh, till now has been based on what is called Moore's law. So Gordon Moore is the co-founder of Intel who made a very interesting observation almost 50 years ago. And what he said was that the number of transistors on a single chip a chip is what goes into the, the making of a microprocessor in a computer, which is the most important part in a computer. The number of transistors on a single chip have been doubling every 18 months. Consequently, the power of computers has been doubling every 18 months, and the cost of computing has been coming down by half every 18 months. And this came to be known as Moore's Law. So Moore's Law has held true for the last uh, more than 50 years. And uh, there is every indication that a similar trend will continue into the future as well. Although some people are challenging that the Moore's law is, uh, itself is reaching its limits because there is only so much miniaturization you can do. There are so many, only so many number of transistors that you can pack on a single chip. But then the other uh, way to look at this entire issue is that paradigms in computing have been changing, right? For example, if you look at the bottom of the, of the slide here, uh, in the 1920s, the paradigm was to do with electromechanical. In 1940s, it went to the relays. And then in the 50s, we had vacuum tubes. In the 60s, we started getting transistors. In the 80s, we started moving to integrated circuits, right? And then now, we are getting into a new paradigm in computing, which is called quantum computing. And quantum computers hold the promise of being 100,000 times faster than the computers as we know them today, right? So since paradigms are changing, this kind of a trend in the evolution of computing capability is likely to continue into the foreseeable future. And this is one of the underlying drivers for the rapid change, the huge shift, the paradigm, paradigm shift that we are talking about, uh, the fourth industrial revolution is uh, going to bring about. And this was the cover of uh, the Time magazine in 2011. One of the implications of, of what, will what the fourth industrial revolution can bring uh, seems uh, almost like science fiction that uh, could 2045 be the year when humanity actually reaches immortality, right? In the prevailing environment where we have COVID-19, someone would perhaps scoff at, uh, at a suggestion like this, but um, there are indicators that the advances that are taking place in medical technology on a yearly basis will likely extend human life by more than a year. So if you put the math together, 
uh, we are moving in the direction of extending human life of, of moving in the direction of immort immortality in fact linda grattan who's based in the uk did some wonderful research on the subject and her research showed that out of uh, the baby is born in the developed world in the year 2007 50 percent of those babies are likely to live an average life of 104 years and it will not stop there as technologies evolve lifespan will keep extending further right and therefore uh, some people call it the event of uh, singularity that the man and machine will become one and therefore we will arrive at a singularity where it will be difficult to distinguish between the two and many people are using terms like digital systems which is a combination of the physical and the digital right now what why is uh, why is it important to understand uh, exponential and why could uh, and how could the possibilities of innovation of evolution in so many industries and sectors actually acquire an exponential trend let me help you understand this so let us say if i ask you to take 30 steps right and these are 30 linear steps and each step let's say is one meter what is the distance you'll cover in 30 steps it'll be 30 meters right let us say i ask you to take 30 steps once again but this time the distance that you cover in each step is going to be double the distance of the previous step right what do you think is the distance that you'll end up covering in 30 steps if you continue with this Remember, the distance you, that you cover in each step is double the distance of the previous step. Okay, let's say you start with one meter. Where do you think it will take you at the end of 30 such doublings, right? And the answer is over a billion meters or almost 26 trips around the planet Earth, right? That is the power of exponential. Uh, very often, uh, we, we, we tend to dismiss it because in the initial phases, it seems to be relatively inconsequential, right? But sooner or later, it reaches a turning point, and then it really explodes and disrupts everything that comes in its way. So uh, this is a gentleman I was talking about, Ray Kurzweil, who's done a lot of work in this area, some wonderful books that he's written around this entire issue. And those of you who are interested can possibly uh, search out these books and, and, uh, and read them, right? So the nature of exponential technologies, like I was trying to explain, is that the initial part, the initial time period in which, these, in which these technologies are evolving tends to be fairly deceptive, right? Because they are starting off a low base, although they are exponential, that means although they are doubling in a given time period, uh, the curve that you draw looks like almost like a flat line. Because let us say you start with one, it goes to two, to four, to six, to eight, uh, doesn't seem to have any significant impact. But sooner or later, it will reach that turning point. And once it crosses that turning point and continues to grow exponentially, that is the time when uh, there is going to be massive change, massive growth. And that is the time when a lot of existing industries will find that they are being disrupted, right? Uh, a lot of uh, digital uh, uh, businesses, right? are actually built on the entire strength of disrupting the earlier way of doing things. So one example was uh, there's a company like Kodak, right? Kodak went uh, bust because they could not uh, uh, continue to remain relevant given the huge uh, digital technology, digital imaging that, that emerged on the scene, right? And therefore they became redundant and, and lost out. So here are some quick examples of, of the exponential trend that I've been talking about. If you look at the solar energy business or solar energy industry, the cost of producing energy from solar has been dropping exponentially, right? And consequently, the capacity for solar voltaic uh, production globally has been growing exponentially. You can see the ex yellow exponential curve of photovoltaic production across the world, right? And you will see this kind of a trend in sector after sector. For example, Airbnb, right? And chances are many of you are familiar with it. Currently, Airbnb is one of the most impacted businesses on account of uh, the lockdown uh, due to COVID-19. But if you look at Airbnb's history, it's been fascinating, right? 
from a level of zero in 2010, they're already into uh, um, uh, hundreds of millions of homestays is the level that they've reached today, right? And this gives an idea of what exponential uh, uh, innovation, exponential technologies can actually help achieve. Here's another example, if you look at it, the way Uber has got its funding, right? If you look at the funding curve for Uber, it's again following an exponential trend. Electric vehicles. So electric vehicles have been there for uh, uh, over 100 years, but till now they have not been able to become mainstream because there have been various challenges in terms of battery capacity, battery size, battery cost, and the time taken to recharge the battery and so on and so forth. But as these problems are being sorted out and as batteries are becoming more efficient, you can see how the electric vehicles are now beginning to show a trend which is uh, which is that of exponential growth, right? So sector after sector is going to be seeing this kind of exponential growth in the years to come. <clears throat> so given this huge uh, explosion in terms of uh, uh, exponential trends being sparked off by, by various technologies which are part of the fourth industrial revolution, and I'll talk about those various technologies in a while, the question that one might ask is, uh, how how does this pan out in the context of a liberal arts education yeah and one thing could be that uh, it could be very overwhelming because when we talk about things like artificial intelligence when we talk about uh, in growth in computing power when we talk about augmented reality and virtual reality when we talk about high speed data transfer when we talk about things like 3d printing or uh, sensors uh, automation and robotics, right? Uh, one might carry the impression that you know you need to be an expert in these sectors to be able to really understand how how they can be, how can you be relevant in in the evolution of these technologies or in the, in working with these technologies, right? To give you an example, uh, we uh, there is a course that I that I do at uh, that I teach at JSLH, the General School of Liberal Arts and Humanities. And this is a course around technology and innovation in business, right? And uh, these are some of the technologies. There are more, but these are some of the technologies we try and cover in that course. And what I encourage students to do is try and figure out how might all of these technologies come together and impact a given industry or a sector. Because the critical thing here is not any of these technologies in isolation, but it is the convergence of these technologies some of which seem to be unrelated to each other. It is their convergence where the real opportunities, the real exciting things begin to start happening, right? So while the underlying driver for the, for the, for the fourth industrial revolution is the huge explosion in computing power that I spoke about earlier, it is uh, these and a few other technologies coming together which are actually contributing to the phenomenon known as the fourth industrial revolution which, like I said earlier, is about the velocity that it has, the speed from linear to exponential, the breadth and depth in terms of impacting various sectors, and bringing about systemic change in society, right? All of these technologies have the potential to bring about that, that change. And therefore, uh, the exercise, for example, we do in, um, in, in class is one of the exercises is how do these technologies impact education, right? Now, on account of COVID-19, Institutions across the world, students across the world, have been in a way forced to undergo uh, an online education uh, process at this point in time. And uh, many of you must already be experiencing it. And chances are many of you are not, uh, are not finding it to be as uh, good as the current face-to-face uh, -face classroom environment that you have had, right? Uh, but think about it for a moment as these technologies start evolving further is it possible for us to visualize a far more interesting uh, interesting possibility as far as education is concerned right uh, let me try and try and share a vision with you so <clears throat> if you look at school education and in many parts of the world school education <clears throat> suffers from various problems for example, in India, there are three or four uh, major problems as far as the broader school education sector is concerned. One of the problems is around uh, quality. So there happen to be uh, regions in the country where for 700 students, there is one teacher. 
So you can't even begin to start thinking about quality, right? And this is actually the case in many of the rural parts of the country. The second issue is cost. Even if you can get quality education, it very often comes at a cost that many can't afford, right? The third issue is about access. So why should a, why should a, a child who's, let us say, in a remote part of the world or in a remote part of India, in a village, why should he or she be denied access to good quality education, right? And the fourth to my mind is of standardization. So if you have a class of, let us say, 30 students, uh, the underlying assumption is that all 30 students are the same because it is the same kind of teaching that is being uh, offered to them. And I think that is a highly unfair because we all know that all of us are different. We all have our own differences in terms of the way we want to learn, how we want to learn, uh, what we don't want to learn, the speed at which we want to learn, uh, and so on and so forth, right? And therefore, it is unfair to assume that everyone has the same learning capability and consequently, uh, the same, uh, uh, therefore, and consequently benefit, therefore, from the same method for delivering education. Now, can you visualize a situation, let us say, in the next five or ten years, right, where these technologies have evolved exponentially further in terms of their capability? Let me give you one example. If you have been in an online classroom today, you'll find that it is very clunky, right? There are, uh, there are often gaps in terms of uh, what the teacher is saying and what the student is trying to learn because uh, there are connectivity issues, there are issues around uh, uh, you know, quality of uh, voice and video and so on and so forth, and also the fact that you can't see the entire class together. Right? Very soon, we're going to have 5G, even in India. And when uh, 5G becomes available and affordable, the gap between the real and the virtual is going to vanish, right? And therefore, it is possible to conceive of a situation where you have a virtual classroom, but you will not be able to make out whether you're sitting in a virtual classroom or whether you're actually sitting in a physical classroom face to face with the teacher and your fellow students, right? Uh, 5G and other technologies allow that future. Think about a situation where, let's say every child has access to an artificial intelligence-based customized robotic tutor, right? And this tutor is able to understand uh, the learning uh, interest, the, le the learning agility, the learning preference of a particular child, and is able to adapt all learning to the context of that child. So let us say uh, a child is struggling with geometry, right? And uh, this child happens to be crazy about football. And the favorite footballer is, let's say, Messi, right? Could you conceive a situation where the child is learning all, ge all geometry in the football field with a virtual digital avatar of Messi actually doing the teaching, right? Technology makes that possible, right? Or think about a situation where there is another child who's trying to understand or study philosophy and this child could be sitting at Plato's feet and uh, Plato actually looking the child in the eye and sharing his uh, thoughts on philosophy. Virtual reality, augmented reality makes that possible. Very often you find children who, are, find, who find history to be boring, right? So is it possible for a child to be actually sitting, let us say in the uh, second battle of Panipat while it, is, while it was actually being fought, right? Uh, digital uh, solutions allow for the creation of these kind of experiences where you will not be able to make out whether it's the real or the virtual, right? And as you do that, the cost of offering these will come down because you have, to, you have a larger number of uh, students who can benefit from it. The quality will be individualized, will be customized, right? And therefore, a lot of potential challenges that we have in education could be taken care of. You might have the question that what role will schools have then? Yes, schools will perhaps continue to have a role, but what might happen is that the role might change. So maybe schools and teachers will begin to start playing a greater role of not of sharing knowledge or helping you develop knowledge, but more in terms of helping you develop curiosity, helping you develop uh, uh, the need and the, and the process of uh, becoming a member of society, of interpersonal relations, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So if you, if, if you think that some of these technological aspects, the ones that I just shared with you, all these technologies can be overwhelming, don't be. Because the critical thing is 
not about being an expert in artificial intelligence. It is not about being an expert in automation or robotics or in sensors, right? But the critical thing is about the ability to understand what the big pieces are, what, what are the capabilities that each of these big pieces can offer. And then this is where the real excitement happens. How can these big pieces come together and start doing interesting things for a chosen industry or a chosen sector, right? And this ability to conceive what can be done will allow or rather will benefit from participants who have a broader understanding of things, who are able to bring a broader uh, breadth of experiences uh, to the table. And that is where a liberal arts education starts becoming very important, right? So this was, I mean, there have been so many studies in the world that have been done about the future of jobs and the future of employment. And I have chosen to uh, refer to this one because this was the first authoritative research that was done on this subject. Carl Benedict Frey and Michael Osborne uh, did a very rigorous analysis of what would be the, the future of work, how will computerization impact uh, various job categories, and they picked up 702 of these job categories. And the interesting thing that they came out with was that sectors or job categories which rely more on human experiences, on, on human intervention, on uh, creativity, on the ability to understand people and relate to them. For example, uh, counselors, psychologists, choreographers, creative, creative oriented professions, creativity oriented professions. These are likely to be the least impacted on account of computerization, right? And if you uh, really analyze the structure of a liberal arts program, you will realize that it is these kind of skills, it is this kind of an education that a liberal, liberal, arts, structure, liberal arts school tries to provide to its students, yeah. So let me share a few quick examples. So Stuart Butterfield is the co-founder of Slack, right? And this is what he has to say about how creativity is going to be one of the biggest drivers going forward in the uh, for uh, industry for any kind of activity in the 21st century and it might interest you to know that Stuart Butterfield has not one but two degrees in philosophy right so you will find that a lot of uh, the most successful entrepreneurs in today's world actually benefit from a liberal arts background that they might have had in their education right uh, Airbnb, we, we spoke about it. So two of the three co-founders of Airbnb uh, have actually been students at the Rhode Island School of Design, or RISD, right? Which is one of the best design schools in the world, right? So once again, look at the importance of a liberal arts orientation, even in technology-oriented industries. So the example of Slack that I gave you, Airbnb that, I, that, I've, that is there in front of you, all of these companies have evolved on the backbone of all these exponential technologies that we've been talking about. Right. So one is having expertise and technology, which is important. But the other is what can you do with this technology in the context of people? How can you bring in more imagination, more creativity? How can you benefit from a deeper understanding of the people for whom you are trying to develop solutions? Right. And perhaps a liberal arts program is very well positioned to offer this, this kind of deeper understanding. Uh, look at the whole issue of ethics. Right. Uh, which is going to become such an important factor in the world going forward. Uh, we have, as a society, in the past made mistakes about the decisions that uh, we thought were good. For example, uh, plastics and its impact on the environment was not foreseen at the time when people were, were developing and selling plastics as a miracle uh, for so many uh, applications and problems in the world. Right? But today we know the, the problems that we are facing on account of plastics. plastics. Right. And as these technologies evolve, there'll be issues that will emerge around the ethical uh, use and the ethical implications of these technologies. So, for example, uh, in one of the classes when we were discussing artificial intelligence, students went back to their discussion in the philosophy class, right? And they brought that discussion in our in the technology and innovation business course about what the implications for the evolution of artificial intelligence could be in terms of ethical frameworks that may need to be developed. And the development of ethical frameworks would once again benefit from 
uh, a liberal arts orientation which uh, which a liberal arts uh, program offers yeah so i thought this would be something interesting for for some of you and how mark cuban and elon musk could go on to say that uh, one of the critical skills in the future is going to be creativity the rest of the article actually does talk about creativity i've chosen to include uh, part of the article which i thought was relevant to today's uh, discussion and how they go on to say that uh, there's going to be a greater demand in the next in the next 10 years for liberal arts majors as compared to programming which is what the uh, the technologies or the technology world offers right and this is because the world is going to benefit from people who can think more freely from people who can bring in a different perspective to any given context or situation right and someone like elon musk holds a similar view as as mark cuban does so the article here talks about the first principles method that elon musk uses and we talk about the the first principles reasoning in some of the courses that we have uh, in the liberal arts school right so you will see more and more of this as you go forward into the future and finally this is what this gentleman has said, has to had, had to say right uh, very often people think that you know something like creativity is the preserve of a chosen few whereas in reality what people like steve jobs and many others have said that creative creativity is really the manifestation of connecting various things what he famously used to say connect the dots right it is about how can you benefit from a range of different experiences or different learning processes that you've been through and how can they begin to start connecting in unanticipated ways in the face of a given situation or a problem or 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 a, or a context right and um, in fact he's gone on record there's a wonderful video of steve jobs if you look for it you'll find it on the on youtube perhaps where he's gone on to say that the people who were part of designing the, the finest operating system and the computers that apple in its earlier stages apart from being great engineers they were also passionate about the liberal arts like music and literature and uh, shakespeare and painting and so on and therefore uh, they could bring that passion of of uh, creativity emerging from a, a liberal arts orientation into the design development of these these fascinating products that apple makes right so my whole point here was that in a world which is beginning to be increasingly dominated by technology uh, we often feel that uh, a, a liberal arts kind of an education may be uh, may not be as relevant but actually that is the real the reality is actually totally the opposite right the future that we are getting into is going to demand uh, more and more of uh, creative thinking imaginative thinking the ability to draw on a diverse range of experiences the ability to bring diverse perspectives to whatever problem whatever situation that uh, one may be confronting and i think uh, liberal arts education is a good starting point for building that breadth in perspective the breadth in capability uh, going forward and therefore uh, a liberal arts education actually fits in very well with the uh, with the uh, with what is the the impact and the requirements of succeeding in the fourth industrial revolution so this is pretty much what i wanted to share with you today and i wanted to leave time for any questions comments and discussion so the next 15 minutes or so let's try and do that so if there are any questions uh, this is the time to start asking them yeah Okay. Difference between liberal arts and conventional arts, advantages, uh, advantages of liberal arts program over others, which type of students should opt for this program? So, I would say that uh, it really depends upon what your personal interests and aspirations are. Uh, uh, this is Ashna, right? Uh, so Ashna, uh, if you think that you will benefit from developing a, a range of perspectives, 
if you can uh, if you want to use education for exploring yourself as a person for discovering who you are where your passion lies where your interest lies then uh, a liberal arts program by virtue of its of, of the breadth of courses that it forces you to do in the initial parts of the program i think uh, prepares you better to determine what is it that you like and then consequently what do you want to choose and what do you want to follow uh, in your future career and the second thing is in terms of advantages of the liberal arts program over others is that because you have this breadth chances are you can end up making a better choice in terms of what is it that you want to do for the rest of your life or in your further studies the second thing is because you have this breadth of perspective tomorrow as you start getting into a career into a job or setting up your own venture whatever it is you want to do maybe in the social sector in the government you can draw upon this broad range of uh, issues that you have discussed in your classes and perhaps that will help you give you help give you a better understanding of of the possibilities yeah so i hope that that answers that uh, dr pradeep sulanki hi aditya how does creativity in computing play a role in the future of uh, digital humanities wonderful question uh, aditya and i think uh, they go hand in hand and that is why i shared the example of uh, of Steve Jobs with you towards the end that even in if you have a, a exponential evolution in computing uh, i think there is a great relevance of bringing in creativity to see how can this capability be leveraged for more interesting outcomes for humanity for the industry for the sector for which you are seeking solutions right so for example even in the applications of ai uh the what uh, what creativity can let, let's say can the people who are developing the ai algorithms uh, can they benefit from a more creative appreciation of what the problems are to which for which this this computing or this ai application can be developed right so these could be very interesting possibilities and despite the fact that liberal arts is a thriving area of study why do you think it hasn't gained momentum in india putra i think uh, my my response to this would be that um, until recently the major focus in india had been uh, to focus on uh, or let's say the major focus had been to sort of in a way limit ourselves to the traditional occupations which were like engineering medicine maybe the civil services government Uh, business over the last couple of decades uh, or business management and so on and so forth right and therefore the emphasis was to enable students develop capability in these areas because that is the occupation that they would follow or the job that they would take up going forward but now as we have uh, as as the economy is uh, is progressing as it's improving forget the current uh, crisis that we faced but otherwise we have a secular trend where the indian economy is going to is likely to have a significant growth over the next two or three decades at least right uh, there is a greater capacity for doing so many new things which people did not have earlier right not only that there are so many people who have experienced education in the west and have realized how liberal arts have have enabled uh, a higher degree of curiosity more uh, freer spirit of thinking and how that has benefited individuals and sectors in various way and that realization is now beginning to come to india and therefore we are seeing more and more uh, liberal arts institutions coming up and a greater interest in liberal arts so to say right so we are moving from the traditional mindset of engineering medicine law uh, or engineering medicine civil services and so on to newer professions that are emerging and consequently the interest in liberal arts yeah okay charlie to get to get on to choose liberal arts what student at the current at the class 11 have to pick as subjects so it really doesn't matter charlie in fact uh, the very fact that liberal arts allows students to sample a, a broad range of offerings before they choose their areas of interest it doesn't matter what your background in the 11th or 12th is right uh, it is not surprising to find a student who has had science subjects in the 11th or 12th choosing to opt for a liberal arts program Uh, once they start getting into college right so don't consider that a limiting factor it is not a limiting factor by any stretch of imagination yeah so other they are also talking about ai is the loss of human life justified at the expense of development of ai 
deaths due to accidents caused by self-driving cars? So simple answer is no, never, right? Having said that, think about this for a moment, Aditya. There is no technology that has only a positive effect. Every technology has a positive and a negative, right? Uh, for example, the atom can be used to uh, kill millions. The atom can also be used to cure disease, right? And these are choices that humanity has to make. We have technologies available to us. To what use do we put these technologies is a critical choice that we have to make as humanity. And therefore, we are maybe at a cusp where uh, we can either embark on a journey of creating a, uh, the, the dystopian future of Mad Max, or maybe we can start uh, creating a utopian future of Star Trek. What future do we end up creating will depend upon the choices we make, right? And uh, I hope you will, you will uh, sort of appreciate the fact that a liberal arts perspective, actually, I'm glad you asked this question, because a liberal arts perspective will perhaps equip you to make uh, the better choices because you benefit from this breadth of understanding that you bring to issues and questions like these. Yeah. Spandana, there have been many conspiracy theories regarding a lack of privacy because of the government tapping all relevant sources and using this. Is there any real truth to this? So I cannot answer Spandana whether it is going to be, whether it is true or not. But I can tell you that privacy is, some of the, is one of the most uh, valued things that we cherish. Uh, nobody wants to, wants to let go of that. And in fact, that is, again, one of the ethical questions that is emerging as far as uh, the application of technologies is concerned, right? How do we ensure that uh, basic human values are not compromised in the process of these technologies evolving. For example, uh, the Facebook Cambridge Analytica episode that happened, right? In fact, all these questions to the fore. And once again, therefore, go back to our discussion on ethics, right? How can we create a framework for application of technology for evolution of business that is more ethically minded? That ethically minded framework will benefit more from, uh, from perhaps from people who have had a, a liberal arts orientation, a liberal arts background. Yeah. Why the liberal Kushku is asking why the liberal arts is compulsory to all? It is not. It is not compulsory, uh, Kushku. Uh, the choice is entirely yours. I mean, if you wish to, uh, it's an option that is now becoming available to uh, to many students. If you choose to follow a, a non-liberal arts uh, education, maybe in the sciences or something, uh, or engineering, uh, by any means. Having said that, the more progressive STEM institutions around the world, engineering colleges and so on, even they are now beginning to include a dose of liberal arts into, into their curriculum because they are realizing that uh, if we can enable engineers, if we can enable those with the STEM, the STEM education to have a little uh, broader, to benefit from a broader sense of, uh, a broader kind of education to develop a better sense of, of things, then chances are it's going to make them better engineers and, and whatever they choose to do. So Nandini, how does liberal arts education help in career fields? What's the difference with this a normal way of education system? So in the career fields, uh, like I said earlier, Nandini, one of the, I think to my mind, one of the most exciting aspects of liberal arts is that in the first few semesters, you have this broad range of, of courses that you undergo, right? And that is the time when you start developing a better sense of what is it that you enjoy more? Uh, amongst all of these courses and therefore you start then making a decision that perhaps this is this is what I want to do or something like this is what I want to do for my further studies and for for building my career or my venture or whatever it is right so I think it helps you make better career choices as you go forward in terms of career fields it's it's uh, it's wide open right ranging from business to um, psychology to art uh, you can have a to government, the social sector, uh, think tanks, multilateral organizations like the United Nations and so on. All of these can be can be interesting opportunities for a student with a liberal arts education. Having said that, most students would normally complete an undergraduate liberal liberal arts program and then do a master's and then uh, build build a, build the kind of career that they want. Yeah. 
uh, Advika, what in your opinion should be the ratio between privacy and security? <laughs> uh, Advika, that's a yeah, that's an interesting question. And uh, ideally, I don't think there are any ratios, right? Uh, privacy is something which uh, we should not be compromising on, on at all. So, so to, to my that to my mind, that is paramount. Uh, the way to frame it perhaps is how can we build secure systems such that our privacy is not compromised? Right? That may be a better way of, of looking at things. Yeah. So Aditya, do you think that uh, traditional parents will attempt to appreciate the future of education that you talked about? It's just interesting to think of, about how various sectors will react to virtuality and its uses. But this is a fascinating question, right? Because uh, go back to uh, the history of evolution of various new developments that have taken place in, in, in humanity's uh, evolution to where we are today, right? And uh, very often there are people who have scoffed at anything new being done, saying that uh, no, uh, this is this does not meet our current uh, framework of thinking, our current set of values, and so on. And then they have gone on to be huge successes, right? So people were scoffed at the Wright brothers when they were talking about flight becoming important, right? And today we don't even think twice, except in recent times now for the last few months, we don't think twice before taking a flight, right? When the first computers were developed, uh, the founder of IBM had actually said that perhaps there is a world market for five of these devices, right? Because thinking at that time in, in IBM was more around uh, photocopy machines, where they saw a market of 5,000 these, right? But we today we don't even think about it. A device like this, which we sat, which we carry so casually in our in our pockets, is uh, more powerful than some of the supercomputers that we had in the past, right? So we are basically, in a way, humanity is not wired to to appreciate the change that is happening around us, right? But over a period of time, as we begin to start seeing the benefits of of change, then uh, people start adapting to it, right? So yes, a lot of it, a lot of uh, what we think technology can offer may seem to some as, some, as being as being uh, science fiction, as being something which, which doesn't make sense, but eventually these same people do begin to start appreciating it once the benefits uh, start becoming evident. Yeah. Okay, so So I don't see any more questions at this point in time. And uh, what I would say in closing is that, you know, these are wonderful times. Uh, the current uh, crisis that we are facing is something that shall pass, right? We have faced similar challenges, similar tests uh, in the evolution of humanity. And in almost every case, uh, there has been pain, but we have been able to overcome these challenges. And I'm pretty, pretty sure we shall overcome this as well, right? What I want to say in closing is that uh, I think all of you are at a wonderful time, at a wonderful place in history, because you are at an age where many of these technologies are just evolving. And you are actually, uh, you're actually growing with these technologies as you grow, right? So in a way, these are, uh, these come very naturally to you. And therefore, you'll be amazed in terms of uh, the possibilities that these can allow about the things that you can do, the, the work that you can envisage for yourself, the institutions, the businesses that you can create, the social organizations that you can develop, right? So in a way you're blessed and chances are, and my hope is, my best, my wishes for all of you are that you can actually benefit from all these technologies from the fourth industrial revolution and hopefully make the world a better place. Yeah. So uh, since I don't see any further questions, once again, thank you for taking time out and uh, being here today. It was a pleasure interacting with you. You asked some wonderful questions and wish you the best going forward in uh, whatever it is that you choose to pursue. Yeah. Thank you and bye-bye.